I'd like to welcome I'd like to welcome everybody to the OTS Connects session on gamification and game-based learning unit design with Derek Schellenberg. And Derek is a, a, an awesome teacher in the York Region District School Board at Sir William Ulock High School, and he has a passion for using um, technology with his students. And I can guarantee that this is going to be a really awesome session tonight. I had a sneak preview yesterday, and um, it's just going to be a fabulous session for you to do a lot of learning and inspire, inspire you to um, use some of the strategies that Derek is going to share with you tonight. So Derek, take it away. Thanks very much, Molly, for that great introduction. I'm really excited to be here tonight uh, with you guys and uh, really respect that you have signed up on your own time to invest in additional learning. I think that's amazing. This is a passion of mine that's relatively recent in terms of my interest in gamification and game-based learning. I'm going to share a lot. I hope that we will be able to discuss some of these ideas, so please post in the chat, uh, ask questions. If you don't stop me, I will get too excited and just keep motoring right to the end. So I'll try to build in a couple breaks, and Mally will help me in terms of drawing attention to when you guys have questions, which is great. So this is just the first slide, and it's gamification, game-based learning. And as we move to the latter stages of tonight's webinar session, we'll get into unit design as well. So a little background information about me. Um, I've been a teacher in the York Region District School Board for more than 15 years. Uh, it's starting to blur in terms of how many years exactly I've been teaching, but it, I know it's 15 plus. And I'm teaching English at a BYOD blended learning high school, which means that students, um, all 1,200 of them, bring their own computers to class every day. And that provides unique opportunities, but also some challenges as well. And lastly, I'm an MA candidate currently at UOIT in Education and Digital Technologies. So the contact information is up here on the right. This slideshow, by the way, is created with um, Slides Carnival, and we're going to give you access to all of the resources both as we go and at the end of the presentation. So to start and to sort of frame our discussion and investigation into both game-based learning and gamification, what we're going to start with is something called a Google Form. And I'm sure that some of you have either A, used it, constructed your own, or B, perhaps administration is starting to use it as a way to collect data from you, which is great. And what it has in it is four questions. The survey is anonymous. And maybe more interesting than the four questions is also this little video, which is two minutes and 19 seconds long. So what I'm hoping that we're going to do is we're going to click on the Google form. We're going to provide the link in the chat box in just a second. And you guys will have a chance to go answer the questions. And what I'd like you to think about as you're watching the video is how do some of these concepts apply to education, to learning, um, to things that you'd like to see your students doing. So what I'm hoping that you're going to do is A, go to the Google form link. B, watch the video, and when you come back, if you could use the check mark feature that Mally explained to us, so it's the fourth um, little tool on the right-hand side, that'll just tell us that most of you have returned and I can sort of proceed um, with the rest of the webinar. So if you could click on the link and watch the video, that would be great. Let me know if you have any difficulties with it. Even if you don't want to share your information with the four questions, please watch the video because it will help frame our discussion for later. If you scroll to the bottom of the Google form, you should see the video embedded in the survey. Sandra.
So when you click on the link, this is what you should see. There's four little questions. And then we have the video down here at the bottom. Molly, could I get you to bring me back into the room if possible? To stop the sharing? Perfect, thank you. Hello, Laura. We're just clicking on perfect. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So everybody is finishing, hopefully watching the video and answering the four questions and then just indicating with a little check mark that you've returned back to the room and we can move forward. So I can see that Beckett is done, and Ashley, Kirsten, Melanie, oh, MJ Trink. So while we're waiting for people to return, could I ask people to use the chat box to share anything they thought was connected to, in terms of education. Maybe things that you'd like to see in your classroom, maybe things that you emphasize in your classroom already. What were some things that were happening in the video that was two minutes long that you think are positive things connected to game-based learning and gamification that we like when we see our kids do it? So Jade's offered critical thinking, collaboration for sure, enthusiasm and teamwork, They definitely were excited, at least for a little while. Awesome. We had inquiry. You know, linear trail is an interesting um, answer, as one clue sort of led to the other. Experiential is a nice answer as well. What I also liked was that the teacher, who had obviously set up the room, if you want to call it a teacher who set up the room, then got out of the way and let the students sort of, as you say, experience it, Jared, for themselves, as opposed to sort of giving them instructions. Yes, they built on prior knowledge. In fact, they probably had so much prior knowledge that they didn't quite get their $200 uh, in terms of their money's worth. So that's great. So there's lots of things there, and we're going to come back in terms of the end of tonight's session to this idea of an escape room at the end. So I'm just going to move on. I'm hoping that most people have been able to see the video. 
So in terms of tonight's session title, we've got these two terms. And I don't know if you've used, um, you know, in terms of Twitter or Teach Ontario or different online communities to sort of engage in discussion, but some people like to talk about the differences and argue over what's the difference between gamification versus game-based learning. So I've tried to provide sort of simple definitions of each. I don't think we should concern ourselves too much about them, and there's definitely some overlap, as you can see, with this beautiful-looking Venn diagram. So on the left-hand side, we have gamification. So I'm using some game mechanics that I'm familiar with, and game design, and I'm putting them in a non-game setting. So I'm assuming my classroom is not usually a game, but I might drop in some game mechanics sometime to try to make things more engaging for my students. So then I'm taking on the role of teacher as the game designer with curriculum, and I think it's a lot of fun to actually take on this role. Then on the right-hand side, we have game-based learning, and that's the use of an existing game and I bring it into my classroom, or I might use it with my children, or that sort of thing. And what I need to think about beforehand is, you know, how am I going to connect this game to what I'm learning, to my students, to the curriculum expectations, those sorts of things. So teacher identifies the teachable aspects, some of which you're going to predict, and some of which are going to be a surprise to you, which is always a lot of fun when you have these teachable moments that you couldn't predict that happen because the kids are doing things. So this is sort of a simplified um, definition of gamification. So I like to use the verb gamify versus game-based learning. I'm dropping an existing game into my classroom. So we're going to move to the next slide and just see how we're doing in terms of understanding that interpretation. So I'm going to pick one of these clouds and I'm going to rely on your help to either tell me to go left, it's gamification of learning, or to go right, it's game-based learning, according to the definition that I provided with you before. So we're going to head to this cloud over here. It says, well, actually, I'm going to go into my Google presentation version of it to do this. So Derek is going to be sharing his screen, so he can't see our responses, so he does have a second screen open, but in order for him to get our responses, if you can type them, um, your responses in the chat box when he puts up the, the sorting um, activity, then we'll kind of come to a consensus and I'll give him um, a response. Will that work for you, Derek? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, that'll be great. So the first one is um, creating a quest in the myth unit. Do we think that's on the left hand side, gamification of learning, or is that more on the right, game-based learning? What does our audience think based on the definition? Did I gamify existing curriculum? Okay, we've got people telling me to go left. left. So I'm going to defer to the group. So that's great. Now I'm going to go down to the bottom here, and it says playing risk in history class, which I have some friends who teach at another school do, first week, high school history. They drop in that. Ashley says right. Kirsten, oh, we have a consensus again. Okay. How about using a Kahoot quiz to access prior knowledge? I don't know if this is going to be tricky or not. Do we think that this is gamification or game-based learning? We got right. Everybody agrees. Okay, so I'll put it over there. And it's interesting if you go to some of these tools, they will actually describe it. They'll say this is gamification of learning. So sometimes they even confuse um, the definitions. The the this one here is it's a game called Prodigy. It's fantastic. It uses the Ontario curriculum. Great for elementary school students and it's designed with a fantasy theme, and students progress at their own pace through all these math questions. It's free, and my kids played it for a while. Sean is screaming at me, right. Okay, I'm going to listen. So I'm going to put that over there. It's going to get a little busy with our clouds. Okay, I'm going to go to the bottom right, clavering to build a castle in Minecraft. Where do we think? It's okay, Sean, I don't mind if you yell at me. Hopefully I'm saying your name right. 
Um, collaborating to build a castle in Minecraft. That's okay. And Nick is telling me left. Okay, I got a question mark. So I'm going to put it over here. Oh, oh, maybe I'll put it in the middle. Maybe I'm safe in the middle. So my, everyone else is saying right, yeah. Um, so collaborating to build a castle in Minecraft. So you take this existing game, Minecraft, and you can do all kinds of amazing things with it. Um, you can also sort of design actual settings and have students work through problem-based learning with it, which is fantastic. Okay, um, designing Jeopardy to review for a test. I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people have done that in the session tonight. I was have to say, oh, I got one left from Sandra. I have to say that I was a little surprised. My one of my sons did a test in grade seven, and it was the Jeopardy game was the test, so that was interesting. Okay, how about playing twenty questions where the students are key characters in a text? What do we think about that one? Just got a couple left here. Playing twenty questions where they have to eventually guess who the key character is in the text. Am I gamifying things, or is it a game-based learning? I think everything's going in. Okay. I'll just put it up there. And I'm assuming nobody's going to do this in their classroom. Working within a guild in World of Warcraft. Very popular game. But maybe not for our classrooms. Okay? And then two other things, and I'm not sure how many of us have heard of these. Both are going to be talked about later in tonight's session. Using Classcraft to manage student behavior. So I will show you what Classcraft is later. I'll just put it on the left for now. And then last, uh, having students solve a breakout EDU box. This is somewhat similar to what we saw with Big Bang Theory at the beginning. For these lefts for that, perhaps. Okay, I'll put it over there. All right, so we'll talk about what those are later, and I'm, I'm sure the comfort level isn't there for some of these things, and that's fine, but just want to think about gamification of learning versus game-based learning. So we're going to move on to the next slide. And I'm going to ask that Mally stop the sharing of my screen. Perfect. And we'll just go to the next slide. So the structure for tonight's uh, webinar is just a sort of a basic three-part structure. The first part I want to talk about is how I was inspired. So why have I been inspired to explore and implement gamification in my classroom on the left? And then we're going to move to adaptation, what game elements looking at lots of other different models that I take from other people and then implement in my classroom. And then lastly, the act of creation, which was the most fun and the most work. How did I actually implement these in the classroom? What tools did I use? How did I design it? So I'll go through those three things. And at different points, hopefully we'll stop. You can ask me questions. Okay. So first off is inspiration. So I'm looking for sources of inspiration and also sort of a, a general path of inquiry to dive deep into these concepts. So I've got lots of questions to begin, and I've got my little footsteps as I'm sort of figuring out my own path as I go in my own learning. So after New Year's Eve, OC MOOC, or whatever it's called, had a little activity for Ontario educators using Twitter where you would sort of, like a New Year's resolution, choose your word for 2016. As an educator, what's going to be my word that's going to be my focus? So you have lots of different people choosing lots of different words. So some of the more common ones, it was called one word, ONT, so that's obviously the most prominent. But we have responsive, connect, intentional, continue, empathy. My little one was over here, inquire, and that's fine. And I'm still slightly perturbed that somebody put childlike, playful, fun. I don't know if that qualifies as one word, but it does connect to some of the things that we're talking about in tonight's session. And I think childlike is actually one word. If I had to re-choose 
I would probably go with experiment, this idea of experimenting in the classroom. I think there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of years about you know, mindset, embracing mindset. We have Carol Dweck's book on the left, Connected to Growth Mindset, and then a more recent book from George Kuros on the right. Again, Osimuk has a little Twitter discussion each week for the next couple of weeks in terms of the innovator's mindset, which, again, I think connects to what we're talking about tonight. So my question for you is, do you feel that you have freedom, license to play, freedom to experiment in your classroom? I'm assuming most of us are educators. If so, could you put a check mark beside your name? If you don't, and then I'm a little bit sad, put an X beside your name. Twelve check marks. Okay. No X's. Wow, interesting. Okay. So the shot of the question was, do you have freedom to experiment in your classroom? So it looks like 15 people do. Oh, and one person doesn't. Oh, there's a check mark that's magically appeared here. Yeah, so we're looking to put it beside our name in the left-hand side, but thank you for the check mark on the slide as well. So can I ask a question for you just to, to answer as a sort of point form in the chat box? What gives you this freedom? Why or how do you feel that you have freedom in the, in the classroom? You know, what situation are you in in terms of stage of your career or the school you work at? What sort of giving you this ability to feel like you can play and experiment in your class? So I'm hoping people will put a little thought or comment in the chat box. So Sandra says admin support, which is obviously key to trying out anything. And then we've got student willingness. Encouragement is fantastic if you're in a school where you actually get encouragement from principals. Mutual understanding that I learn alongside students, fantastic. We're going to learn together, so as opposed to being adversarial. Willing to take risks, new teacher, LTO. Every student has a laptop. That's really cool. That's an awesome place to be in. My mentor teacher encourages a lot. Still a student teacher. Okay, very cool. So we've got lots of different reasons why we feel that ability to play in the classroom, which is fantastic, and probably why some people are here. Open minds, being willing, supported, and taking risks. That's great. And I think when you're taking risks along with the students, that's fantastic, and it's, it's great for them to see. So in terms of my um, inspiration, um, in the last couple years, I've been fortunate enough to be involved in a couple of Ministry of Education projects, and if you haven't heard of them, you should definitely explore. So one of them is called the TLLP, Teacher Learning and Leadership Program, and once you've done one of these and you get to design your own PD, you work with a small group of educators, um, you get access to purchasing technology, which is fantastic. Um, that's sort of the, the first version of it. And then the second opportunity is once you've done a TLLP, you can do something called a PKE, which means Provincial Knowledge Exchange. So these are both amazing programs, um, and they choose, I think, two projects from every board every single year. So fantastic. So basically, in doing this for the last couple of years, it's given my group from my English department an opportunity to go to lots of conferences to play, to share your learning, that sort of thing. So um, in the spring, 2015, we went to something um, called Connect in Niagara Falls. They have another one in the fall called um, Echoes BIT, Bring It Together. Both great, combining education and technology. And then this summer, went to a fantastic conference, ISTE, in the United States. Blew my mind. Um, and it was in Philadelphia. Both of them were fantastic. So one session that I was at was presented by Heather Birch, and I'm going to show you what she constructed in terms of her version of gamifying her classroom in a specific unit, 
and then I'll talk briefly about some of the other sources of insp inspiration. So this is Heather's um, website that she created. It is a Weebly, and she has, as you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six links across the top. She's called it Gamer World, and you can see there's a science fiction theme to her main image up here. In this home page, she used it as a place to drop um, comments or messages from her, and she recorded them using Bokeh, which is a fantastic little tool. And it um, gave her the ability to give students sort of comments um, occasionally throughout the semester or unit. So Bokeh is interesting in that, I don't know if, you yeah, know, let's see. So you press play, it weirdly follows the little thing around. And then if I press play down here, you'll get Heather's message to the kids which we won't listen to. And so yeah, so this last one was congratulations on the unit being complete. So she used Voki as the first tool. Then we have an about section and her focus, which was interesting. So, you know, it's gamer world, it's gamification, those sorts of things. But she wanted to focus on child's video game play. So she has this tip sheet for parents in terms of, you know, how do I balance the amount of time that my kids use video games. And what I think she did that was amazing is with her grade seven and eight students, she put the curriculum expectations right here up at the front in terms of, you know, mapping out her unit. And it's also cross-curricular. So it's healthy living, it's math, and it's media literacy. So here's all the curriculum expectations that she was targeting for the unit. Fantastic. So direct connections to the curriculum. Amazing. Contact information. And not only, and I think this is great, not only did the students create avatars, but she created one for herself. So here's Big Hero Birch, which obviously is connected to Big Hero 6. And then the next step was she created um, teams, groups, etc. And not sure if she chose them or if the kids chose their own, but she did allow them to choose their own names for their group, and then they have a little image connected to them. And then what she did, which is fantastic, is this is sort of her leaderboard, and she used a Google spreadsheet and embedded it right into her website. So you can see here we've got group missions, you get a certain amount of points, you've got solo missions, if you complete them you get a certain amount of points, and then you actually have sort of these bonuses, so this is a level complete bonus, and she set up her spreadsheet so it tallies everything up nicely, and you can see her total XP. And so we create that sort of competition effect between the different groups. And I think this is great because you've got names of the groups, you've got avatars for the individual students as well, but we're not necessarily centering out the student is doing amazing compared to the student who is 25th in a class of 25. Then, Going to the next part of her website, she's got the media literacy component, so different aspects of that that the kids constructed, which is great, and she's got these awesome rules that they need to consider before they post anything online, which is fantastic. And then last but not least, we have the actual game rules that she set up, so she calls it how to beat this game. So we've got here personal XP different types of missions, and then she separated it from team TP, and that means team points, doesn't mean anything else. And then we've got her levels in terms of her activities. So level one, level two, level three, level four, and the assumption is that each mission is connected to specific curriculum expectations and that it gets more difficult as you progress through the levels. So this was my sort of aha epiphany moment. Wow, that's really cool. How would I apply it to English? And immediately I'm starting to think about what units I gamify, and also starting to think about um, what tech tools am I going to use to design my own version of this. So this was one of the initial inspiration pieces for me. Mally, can I get you to stop the sharing? We'll go back. That's great. 
Okay. So I went to ISTE after that. So this was in um, the spring, Connect 2015. Went to ISTE and then for four days went to sessions and I made sure I hit five or six that were connected to game-based learning and gamification. All the resources for all these presentations you'll have access to. So Vinograda is talking about his idea of this quest uh, structure that he's created for games. Michael Matera, who's got a book out recently called Explore Like a Pirate. You can go visit his Realm of Noble site, which is fantastic. Dr. Daniel Harold focused on pedagogy. Jessica King was amazing. It was an immersive session where you walked in. I think I joined Galileo's Gas Giants when I walked in. And you were put in this team on a ship and essentially, unfortunately, it was chemistry and I'm an English teacher, but basically what you had to do was Earth was no longer habitable. You had a limited number of humans left alive and you had to find habitable planets using chemistry and it was fantastic and it was really difficult. And then we had this last one, Angela Cordy's highly intellectual presentation, which was great on both teacher badges and student badges, which I found fantastic. And I'll show you how I took from different ones to incorporate into my own. So continuing with that, English teacher, I need to do some reading. So we focused on reality is broken. So Jane McGonigal sort of gamifies aspects of her own life. Then we've got multiplayer classroom, and Lee Sheldon is a professor, and he, if you get his book, he talks about how he gamifies his classes. It's really practical and helpful. And then lastly, we have this most recent book, which came out right before Christmas, Explore Like a Pirate, and that's for, he used an elementary classroom, uh, and it's also amazing. And then there's some other resources as well. So, I don't know about you, but I love TED Talks, so here's a bunch of them that are connected to it, some of which I've watched before and realized the connections afterwards, and some I watched with the intention after deciding that I was going to gamify my own classroom. Um, John Hunter's game is amazing. It's called the World Peace Game, where elementary school students um, solve issues around war and resources and countries, and it's amazing. And then we've got the one at the bottom here, Will Wright's Spore, Birth of a Game. To me, it's like science teachers should be using this game. I immediately got it for my kids. And you start off as like a little amoeba, and eventually you're like a, from a civilization traveling from planet to planet. So it's really cool in terms of how the game evolves. So these were all the things that I sort of dug into before I wanted to play myself. Okay. So here is one of those TED Talks. It's Paul Anderson. It's very specific to what we're talking about tonight. And it's his process in terms of taking the summer. The amazing thing about coming back in September is we can sort of reset and redesign our classroom. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to watch just the beginning from 000 to 3.40, 3 minutes and 40 seconds, but thinking about these three questions in mind. What are ideas connected to learning that you agree with, that you get on board, that Anderson's sharing, that he used in his classroom? What are ideas that you disagree with? You don't think they have any place in the classroom? And lastly, what are some ideas that you might not be sure about in terms of do you buy into them? Would you actually try them in your own classroom? So again, when you come back, we want you to put a check mark beside your name. And in the next slide, we're going to do an activity with this TED Talk. Yes, yeah. so no, and we'll put it in. Um, we'll watch it um, in the web tour. And I, if you aren't avail able to do that, if you're on a mobile device, you can click on the link, and it will take you to that video. So there's a couple ways that you can do that. So click on the link, or we can watch it together on the web tour. And I'm just going to put it up right now. Okay. okay. So you guys have three minutes and forty seconds. Think about those three. Uh, sort of framing questions, and then if you could let us know when you come back by using a check mark, that's great, and we'll do a little activity and you can talk about which elements you'd use or wouldn't use or maybe you're a little bit confused about.
It looks like people are starting to finish, which is great. So we've got Melanie, Melissa, Samantha, Jade. Okay. More than half. So I think we're going to go back to the slideshow, and what we're going to do, oh, 17 people, that's great, is we're going to go to the next slide, and what I'm going to ask you to do, and if you could sort of describe the idea, something that you either use already in your classroom and you agree with it as something we should be doing, something you disagree with, you don't think that we should be going out of our way to make school engaging, that's fine. Ideas you're unsure of. I don't know how this would work. So if you could attempt to use the text tools and write on my slides, that's totally fine. Pick a column and um, share what you think. Okay, there's two ways that you can use the text tool. Um, one is to use the pencil and, um, and write with the pencil. Or you can um, access, you can see where the A is, and it'll create a little text box, and you can type in um, under the column that you have your ideas. So, so far we've got the idea of going at your own pace, and leveling up, which is great. If you're not comfortable typing in here, you can type in the chat box as well. So an idea we're unsure of, abandoning lectures entirely and leveling up. And I think, not sure in terms of the three minutes and 40 seconds, but he goes on to say in his reflection that one of the things he would like to sort of redo is building in social elements into his classroom. So he had lots of individualized tasks. Kids were working. It's connected to their curriculum. But I think a little self-criticism that he had was um, that he wants to have more social elements built back into his classroom. Letting students use my computer. Okay. Yeah, time is definitely an issue in terms of initially setting this up. I think failure is okay is a, is a great message for sure. Yeah, so he was able to differentiate leveling students accordingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is a challenge as well. Okay, so there's a number of different ideas. There's nothing that we outright disagree with. Oh, maybe somebody's going to type something here. And I'm not sure what the squiggly line suggests in the middle. Okay, so we've got some different ideas. Finding good ways to differentiate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the time issue is definitely a challenge. Time in terms of how much the unit's going to be, and this pacing thing that we like here on the left is also going to be um, a challenge as well in terms of flexibility. Both self-pacing as some students go ahead and self-pacing as we support the students who are not able to sort of maintain that average pace. Okay. Too much screen time for kids. So there's another balancing thing. Just because I gamify something doesn't mean that it all has to be connected to technology. I can create a gamified activity that uses paper, pencils, scissors, etc. So that's an interesting point as well. Okay, so I think we've got most of them. Finding good ways to differentiate without stigmatizing, that's good. Oh, we're getting some other posts. What do post-secondary schools think of? Is that connected? Frustration. If, Maybe we'll just separate these people. 
What do post-secondary schools think of this? Will students be using this in their, I'm guessing the last word might be classroom. I agree with the time issue. Yep, making sure our classrooms. Okay. So before I go on, uh, Mally mentioned that you guys have, you have the option of using your microphone. Does anybody want to state their points, or does anybody want to ask a question at this point before we dig a little deeper into what this might look like? Any brave souls who want to speak? This is one of away. No? Okay. So then hopefully people will ask questions later on then. All right. I'm going to keep going. In terms of the next slide, it connects to the same TED Talk. And three of the quotes that I just pulled out were, schools should be fun. And I think this is something that I both agree with, but also depending on the day, perhaps depending on my mood, sometimes I think that you know, students need to persevere and, and be strong and complete the work and whatever. It doesn't have to be all enjoyment, but sometimes I argue with myself over that. Um, a lot of people brought up the next quote, the idea of failure is okay. And I think sometimes they get this message um, outside of school in terms of, you know, they're playing video games or they're attempting to acquire skills, whether it's skateboarding or riding a bike or that sort of thing, and they just keep doing it until they eventually learn. But sometimes when there's one opportunity to demonstrate our learning, if it's one test or one assignment, then, again, they might feel that stigmatized if they're not successful with that task. And then lastly, a lot of people mentioned the self-pacing. Students should be able to move at their own pace through a mastery system where they master a level and then they can move on to the next level. So this is sort of a goal or an ideal of game design. Um, but again, it's a challenge in terms of, I don't know about you, I have a 75-minute class and I have 89 periods to teach. And when I was away on Friday at this little think tank, the fact that work didn't necessarily happen, now I have 88 days left in which to teach. Um, so that can be a challenge. So after digging into all of these different things in terms of books, conferences, and workshops, and TED Talks, and all this sort of stuff, rather than having tons of answers, I had tons of questions. These were the questions that I had that I wanted to wrestle with. Some of them I had an idea, and some of them I needed to play with. So we've got here at the top, what technology should I use? I had some ideas. Should students start with zero points? Some models they do, some models they don't. Is it important for students to have an avatar in the game to separate themselves from whoever is going to be failing at these different tasks and achieving in others? Um, I think this one on the right is really powerful, having a narrative that drives the game, sort of this ongoing story. It doesn't have to be an English class. It could be science. It could be in other classes. Um, and lots of other questions. Should points be earned be viewable to the entire class? Should points earned in the game be linked to marks? I thought that was a really important question that I wanted to wrestle with. Individual and group success. Um, and then, of course, again, we get back to that student pacing, which I think we're all interested in. And then the question is competition between students good. We want to make sure it's friendly competition as opposed to something else, where somebody feels better and somebody else feels worse. So I had lots of questions going into my little summer where I would design um, my gamification. So the next section of tonight's webinar is adaptation. So the idea was, um, how could I take some of the elements that I thought were important and implement them in my own unit? So something that I've been introduced to at a number of different um, conferences, student teachers, that sort of thing, was the idea of class craft. And this is free. And it basically offers you a chance to put a gamification lens on top of any classroom. So it can be used in science. It can be used in elementary. I shared this on the first PD day with three or four of my colleagues at my school. And so we had one person in grade nine applied English and one person in 
in grade 10 math. They all just sort of jumped on it, and they're all playing with it right now. And basically what happens is each student in your class, you create their login. No personal information is required, which is really nice, um, can choose. They can choose what class they're going to be, so a healer, uh, warrior, or mage. They can choose skin color, um, which is interesting. They can choose gender. We have a little experimentation going there as well. And then um, what happens is as they move up in levels, they can differentiate their character in terms of both the clothing, the hairstyle, the pets, the spells, the abilities, these sorts of things. And the nice thing is you can all tailor it to your class. One of the aspects that the kids love is you can have a random event to start the day, and the random event could be something where, you know, one group has to sing a song, and this is what the reward is. Or you can tailor them so they're all directly connected to the curriculum expectations for your specific class. Um, it was a lot of fun. The kids loved it. We used it for four weeks. The kids wanted to use it for all 18 weeks of the course. And I think it was great because we created the avatar here, and then we incorporated the avatar in lots of the different uh, activities we did later in the unit. So this is a great place to start and play. And it works in elementary and secondary. Does anybody, before I go on, does anybody have any questions about Classcraft? Shauna, do you have a question? We've got the, what, so there's no, yeah, okay. So Jade's question, what is the story behind it? So if I take your question literally, it's not a story sort of thing. It's basically what I would call putting a lens. You put a lens on your class in terms of gamifying your class. So it's something that's behavioral. So I would have, for example, five or six positive things and five or six negative things that were default settings. So what would happen is if my students came into class and without me prompting them, they opened their computer and it was on and ready to go before the class started, they got 50 points. If they asked an interesting question that benefited the class, an original question that benefited the class, they got so many points to it. So the idea is that it enhances some of the things that you want them to do, and um, maybe it sort of emphasizes some things that you don't want them to do. We didn't really use it as, an, as a negative thing. It was a lot of fun. It's, it's not really an, Emma, uh, sorry, an LMS. It's not a learning management system. It's more of um, behavioral in terms of it emphasizes different things. It also has an, a new feature where it allows these sort of boss battles, which I think are kind of like quizzes, um, where you can set one character up against another. Um, so it can be fun. So it's not really like Class Dojo. The point of it was to have students create an avatar, and then we built the avatars right in. So they had individualized characters, and we built them into all the activities. So this was one of the first things that I used, and it had the biggest impact. And we used it every day. Um, for the unit. So I think I answered most of the questions there, so I'm going to keep going. One aspect that I saw in a lot of the different um, game design units that people constructed was the idea of having badges, so people earn different things in addition to points as they progress through the unit. So in the final ISTE session that I went to, Angela L. Cordy's session, she talked about different ways that you can use badges and construct them. This is a very simple one here. Um, it's called Make Badges, and it allows you in 30 seconds to design a badge. And you can choose from a bunch of different templates, about 20, and it has little symbols that you can choose from the middle. You name it, whatever you want. So I just called this one Puzzle Guru. And um, so yeah, so I wanted to have badges. I created three per level. There were four levels in total, and then I hid them. I hid them all throughout the website. We did the first one together, so it would have a different task when they opened it, and then students would choose whether they wanted to achieve it or not. So we had 
the main activities that everybody was going to be doing, and then we had additional activities that I treated like Easter eggs, hid them throughout the site, and some kids would want to collect all 12, some kids would do two or three, and that's fine. They were additional learning on top of um, the principal learning that I wanted to get through. So that's one thing that you can do. So I actually added them into my Google Docs, and I'll show you how later on. Okay, so here was sort of the pedagogical differences that I came up with as I looked at different people's examples of gamification. And you may say, you know, my traditional classroom or my classroom doesn't have some of the things on the left, and that's totally fine. And these are some of the features on the right that gamification attempts to provide to students. So the idea is, you know, students are perfect before the first assignment, they get an 82 or a 73 or whatever, and then maybe they can't ever get 100 again. So not necessarily going up. Oftentimes, we design our classes so the unit takes so long, so we want to move, for the most part, at one speed. We have a class due date. There might be one opportunity in terms of a major summative task uh, in a unit or in a cycle of learning. So there's individual success. Students are competing within themselves in terms of their expectations, their parents' expectations, maybe their peers' expectations, but hopefully their marks aren't revealed to everybody else. They're working at one level often, so you get students who are hitting level threes and some students who are hitting level fours, and sort of this consistency develops in terms of, you know, I'm usually this level of the student. And so some of our elements are predictable, and sometimes the students, unfortunately, perceive our, our classes as work. Um, and then if you look at James Paul Gee's um, talks, he talks about, you know, I designed this beautiful assignment and it's four pages or it's five pages or it's longer and it has everything explained and it has rubrics and all this sort of stuff. And the students perceive them as, you know, a rule book or an instruction manual. And I think like a lot of us, when I buy my beautiful device from Apple, I don't really look at the instruction manual. I start playing with the device and I figure it out. And if I've got a question, I ask somebody else who's got a device usually. Maybe you read the books. I'm not sure. So yeah, so there's the traditional, and then on the right side, we have the gamified version of the classroom. And it's interesting because it's a bit of a mental shift. We're going to start at zero. We're all at zero at this point. If you didn't do anything else right now, you would have zero points at the end of the four weeks or however long your unit's going to be. We do want to have that self-pacing, so students moving at their own speed. Um, we want students to have an opportunity when they're individually ready to then demonstrate their learning as opposed to dictating to them when they'll demonstrate it. Um, some of the different models call this facing the boss when they do that summative task. Multiple opportunities if we can. So maybe it's not that one mark on the test and I own it for the rest of my life. Maybe I have three chances or five chances to do that summative task for that cycle of learning. Team success is important, open competition in terms of those points being shared, having a leaderboard, I'm moving up levels. We want to put in unpredictable elements, so the surprises, that's going to make it more fun. And then this last concept I think is really interesting and again required a shift for me, not giving them all the information up front. So yes, I designed tasks where they, you know, they built on each other and they got more difficult and that sort of thing, but maybe I parcel out the information as needed as opposed to just dropping it on them and saying, you got everything, how come you couldn't do the assignment? Well, you gave me 10 pages at once and you overwhelmed me as a student. So I think that just-in-time parceling out sometimes can be more effective than providing them with everything they need up front. So these are just some, some key differences that I noticed. So these were the choices that I made for what I was going to construct. So grade nine English, specific unit in mind. I was going to teach or select the groups to try to balance them. They were called houses, depending on what type of model you use, whether it's fantasy or science fiction or dystopian or whatever, you might choose a different name for how you're going to group them. I wanted a balance of the solo and the group quests and have points for them, so four weeks, four levels, 
Initially, the plan was for some of the assignments. Because of class craft, we were using it. They had three choices in terms of their avatar separating from themselves. And then I wanted a leaderboard, which I put on the Google site, and it was going to display group points. I decided not to have individual points shown. And then there's this concept called the quest giver. Rather than the teacher always saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, they would actually have different ways of figuring out what was the task. So in some cases, we used, because it was a fantasy model, scrolls. And um, in others, we had videos, iMovies. I'll get to Jade's question in just one second. And then with badges, we had three per level, 12 in total. And I used them as Easter eggs and sort of hid them all through the Google site. Um, I think that that's a great question, Jade. And I think the wrath of the rest is also a positive thing in terms of, you know, you want people to learn that not only are they going to impact themselves, but they're going to impact each other. Um, so groups were able to complete the tasks even if the individual didn't do their work, didn't play up their role. Um, one thing we do with all our assignments, whether we're in gamification mode or not, is um, they get individual marks. When it comes time to the actual evaluation of the student, even though we did a group activity, they got individual marks. So completion of the task, points, separated from summative task, marks. So that's one separation that I wanted to incur. In terms of prizes, Shauna, I didn't give prizes at the end. So the prizes were things like, you know, your group pummeling another group in terms of acquiring points. The prizes were the speed in which you completed the task. So some people got way ahead, which was a positive thing. And uh, so, yeah, we didn't give any prizes. Um, I didn't give any prizes. I guess some students would consider acquiring those badges as they went to be a reward. So I guess there's different ways that we can reward kids. And I think the thing is, with what I created, um, they had different things for different students. So some students were interested in this part of it. Some students were interested in that part of it. OK, so now we're heading into the third and sort of final section for um, the actual creation in terms of unit design of this site. And again, if you have questions, please let me know and feel free to use the microphone. So here it was designing the game, wanted to play and incorporate game mechanics and game elements into the myth unit. And to be honest, I liked the myth unit before, so I was curious as to whether I was going to like it as much once I put all these elements into it. So as I mentioned, I went with a Google website. And this screenshot at the top here was some of the initial instructions they received. And then on the right-hand side over here, we had um, one of the main focuses of the unit, which was the idea of the quest or the hero's journey. So starting with call to adventure and working around status quo. So that was worked into a lot of the initial tasks in the first and second level. With my particular theme, and I think you need to come up with a theme, just like you need a narrative component to your game, that's what I would suggest, was obviously the fantasy genre. And then what I constructed, and this was for all my units actually throughout the course, but for this unit, I would have an iMovie trailer that would introduce the unit to get them excited about it, what are they going to do, the avatars they're going to take on, these sorts of things. So I would play this, or actually I embedded it in the Google site, and they would play it when they sort of got to that page. And the purpose was to sort of tease them about what was going to come next. So I'm going to move to the next slide. So this is another screenshot of the same Google site. And the structure was essentially um, four levels. And they started at the bottom, which again was interesting. Instead of you know, level four students starting where they thought they needed to be. So that everyone was a novice to begin. And then you moved up. And the tasks were designed to be you know, knowledge foundational at the beginning, more challenging as you moved up. And I wanted them to take on a different role with the tasks as they moved from level one, two, three, four. So the first one is, I don't know anything. 
about, you know, storytelling and mythology and literature and that sort of stuff. And the next was, I'm becoming an apprentice, I'm acquiring information. And then I was a champion or a guardian or a hero. And then eventually the final tasks were guide or mentoring tasks, where they would either be helping each other or creating things in terms of legacy pieces that would help the next group of students that would go through the same unit. So the role changed as they moved through each level of the, um, of the unit. So you can see here on the right, we have the four levels and then we have points connected to each. And then we had major summative tasks. And I think you'll find this as well. There was definitely reflection happening on my part as we moved through the four units. Um, so initially I had one at the end of each level. The levels were approximately a week. Some students were faster, some students were slower. And then eventually I decided that the second time through, we would do it two, two for the whole unit. So one at the end of level two, and the other one at the end of level four. So that was one change that I made. Um, I liked all the assignments. I loved them, actually. The one that the students loved was the Choose Your Own Adventure group story. We used Google Docs. It was a collaborative assignment. At the end of it, each scene that the students wrote, there was a choice. Do you fight the dragon? Do you run? You know, and of course, we had different things happen at the end of each scene. But it was fantastic in terms of the students collaborating together on this group writing. Amazing. They loved it. So I mentioned before the concept of a quest giver, and that is somebody external from the teacher, something, someone, who winds up giving them the task. So of course, we had Google Sites. We had uses of video. Um, and because it was a fantasy model, we used scrolls. And we embedded the scrolls into the site. And so as they hit each task in each level, there would be a page, and it would describe sort of the narrative component of the task before they actually got into the hard work of doing whatever it was they were supposed to do. I also created sort of this um, codex file that was quite long, and it had a description for each one of the tasks. So you got a balance of solo and group tasks as they move through level one, level two, level three, and level four. So they were all here. Students, if they wanted to, could see ahead in terms of what was coming. Um, it was all mapped out for them. So this is just an example in terms of describing the, the story. So the idea was that they were going to learn about stories and how to tell stories. And this would give them power over whatever as they moved through the different levels. Um, and I think what some models use is they use more videos. And they actually use teachers or other people to either in the video format or live come in and they assign the task playing in character in a role connected to your unit. So that can be a lot of fun when you've got other teachers who are actually assigning the task to the kids or presenting the quest or the challenge to them. The kids will enjoy that as well. So in terms of the um, avatar, what we did is we took screenshots from Classcraft and keeping in mind that as they moved up in levels of Classcraft, their character would evolve, so they could take another screenshot and they would do that. And what I would do is I created a template. I think it was using Google Drawings. And they would paste their image here. Our course theme was identity, so everything connected to the idea of them figuring out who they wanted to be. And then we had a description here of this is for level one some solo quests, group quests. So they would, for example, choose a patron deity after researching different types of mythology. Then they read a story and they constructed a plot diagram. And the task got more and more complex and challenging as they moved from level one to level two, level three, level four. If we go to the next slide, you can see this is an example of their player character. And not only were they creating the character, but in the assignments, in the stories, they would actually build their characters right into what we were doing, which was great. So in this particular one, he's chosen to be a mage. He's part of House Pegasus. His patron deity is Osiris. 
And what they did was they wrote the backstories of their characters. So we had practice in terms of writing different narratives. This had to be, I think, 100 words um, exactly. And, um, and that was fine. On the left and the right, you can see the different badges that they could acquire as they moved through the different levels, three per level. The first one here on the top left, we all did, where they designed sort of their family or house shield. And then the other ones were hidden throughout the website, and students would find them. And some of them were, you know, peer critic, where you got points for editing one of your neighbor's work. Another one was this trickster one, where you actually assigned a quest to another competing group. So there were all kinds of different things that they could do. So there were 12 in total, and the kids enjoyed sort of figuring them out. This is um, level one, the first two activities. So this is using Google Docs. So what we did is we created templates and exemplars for them. So this is one for somebody who had chosen to do Poseidon on the left. And then we have another god over here on the right. And they would go and research, and they would construct their own um, patron deity that would help them in times of need as they move through the unit. And then for a later task, we used Google Form, like the one that you guys did at the beginning of today's session, where we embedded the video right into it. And then they had questions they had to answer. And this was a relatively simple task. And again, it focused on that um, overarching theme for the unit, which was the hero's journey. This is something that I think is probably key to your unit, is having some type of leaderboard. And this also was a little bit of a dilemma for me as a teacher, um, because I was torn between the idea of, you know, they've got these avatars. Should there be an individual leaderboard that people see? And I went with the idea of a, a group leaderboard. So what happened was I went online and got a tutorial in terms of Google Form to Google Spreadsheet, and I used Google Form to input on a daily basis how many points each group sort of acquired. So we've got House Goat in the lead, and unfortunately House Mermaids at the bottom here. Um, not that different. This is they both achieved level four at this point, and then you can see the bar graph communicating the same information. In terms of reflection, to go back. I would probably have maybe on a weekly basis per level, maybe the top five or the top 10, um, but definitely not have from one to 30 and have somebody sitting there in 30, possibly for four weeks in a row. I don't think that would be a great thing to show to my students. OK. So these are some of the tools that I use for um, creating this unit. And some of them were ones that I had been using before, and some of them I had to learn about for to, to construct this actual unit. So we've got here Google Sites. So that was the home of everything. Used all of the different Google apps. And one thing that some of you may not have heard of is a script or an add-on called Doctopus. It's fantastic. You put it onto your Google spreadsheet. You create your class list. And then what you can do with it is I can take one document, so you know, one Google drawing, one plot diagram, one handout, and Doctopus allows me to then send it to everybody's Google Drive. And I have a copy. I'm sorry, I don't have a copy. I have ownership of all of the documents. So I think a lot of us use it where the students make a copy and they share back with the teacher. This is great in that I have all 30 files in one folder, um, and I'm the owner, so I can see when students work in the document. I can give them feedback long before the assignments due, and I can check revision history to see when they did it and who contributed if it's a group document. So Doctopus is really powerful. You can get some of the same features if you use Google Classroom. Then we used iMovie, YouTube, make badges to construct the badges, Twitter. Twitter is embedded in my course Moodle. Students don't need to have a Twitter account to use it. My parents of the students can choose to follow if they want, but it had daily notices in terms of what we were doing, what's coming up, possible assignments, that sort of stuff. 
And then lastly, Classcraft was the big game changer in terms of adding that lens onto the classroom and really getting students to buy into that this was going to be a gamified unit and they were going to take on this avatar. So these were the tech tools that I used. Um, any questions here in terms of tools or unit design? Any questions from the group? No. Okay. So, going to keep going. In terms of this last section, being mindful of time is 844. Are there courses offered in the summer that we could learn more about this? Um, I think the short answer is probably no, Grace. There aren't courses offered. I know that um, OTF offers multiple sessions um, this semester or this part of the school year on gamification. So there's another one coming up in April. I think there's another one coming up as well in a couple weeks, which is a different take on gamification. So they're helpful. I know they're an hour and a half, and you're probably looking for something more. If you could get to an EdTech conference, you can probably see how different people have created their own, which might be helpful as well. So those are some options for you. In terms of reflection on what we did, um, here are some thoughts that we had in terms of some things. So going back to those questions that I had, um, the questions sort of in blue are things where I'm still investigating or exploring. No problem. Um, so what technology should I use? I'm pretty comfortable in terms of the technology I did use. I'd probably place more emphasis on uh, video, for example, in terms of that being engaging, short video, whether it's using Google Form, or you can also embed video in um, TED Ed Lessons, which is really powerful as well, which we used a little bit. Um, does increased engagement lead to increased learning and achievement? We definitely got the increased engagement. To me, my classes in terms of the marks were probably similar in terms of most of my kids were around a B plus, A minus range. Uh, will things earned in the game be meaningful to students? Is competition between students good? It's another question to be explored. In terms of the red, should points earned in the game be linked to marks? I really thought that they shouldn't be, and I'm still committed to that. I think they need to be separate. You get points for completing an activity, but I thought that marks needed to be, I'm going to evaluate the quality of your work. So they might get 100 points to complete the activity, but they might get an 82 in terms of the quality of the summative assignment. So we separated those things in terms of completion versus evaluation. Can I release responsibility for learning to my students? I'll just take that question in one second. So for this one, um, I think I needed to actually step back more. I felt that I was actually, the, the, the unit was set up, there was social elements to it. The kids loved it. They did some presentations. Um, they worked in groups every day, so it was fantastic. But I still felt that I was saying too much, giving too much instruction, when I actually wanted to see them actually figure things out on their own a little bit more. So I think turning to problem-based learning more than me sort of helping too much. And then should individual and group success be linked? I think that's something you have to be really careful about. We want them to work in groups, um, but it's something to be careful about. In terms of this question in the chat box, what if you had students that struggle with reading? Is gamification still available to them? I think, I mean, the short answer is yes, it was still available to them. I think one part that helped is the fact that they were in a group, so that was one thing. The other thing is, even though there was text in the slideshow, I'm sorry, text on the Google sites, it wasn't a big text-driven, I didn't think it was a big text-driven unit in terms of, you know, we have other units where it's a novel or it's a play or that sort of thing. So in comparison, it was relatively simple, and it was a lot more doing than it was reading or talking or those sorts of things. So the, I found the students more active in this unit. Um, what if you have students for whom you normally have to modify the content? 
So in terms of answering your question, I think sometimes I have to modify the expectations in terms of how they'll complete the task. So I did have some students, one student struggled with sentence construction and capitals. He, you know, he just, in terms of peer editing, every second word, you know, needed help. And so we had to change um, what I, he was still doing the same assignments, but he was doing them on a different level in terms of he would do peer editing, but he would never be able to correct everything as much as somebody else. So that was definitely a challenge for sure. There were two or three students in each class where we had to look at those expectations. Yeah, so in terms of the next question, do you have a main web page? So what happens is we all use, or most of us at my school use Moodle, and it had a link for each unit. There would be a link to a Google site. So they would click on it, and if I have time, I'll just show you the Google site quickly. Um, and it had all the resources in it. And the nice thing about it, if you use Google site is every Google app you use, you can actually see the Google Doc. You can see the Google drawing there. It's not just a link. It becomes a great way to show people's work. People are looking all the time for portfolios. To me, Google Site is amazing because you can see their work and you can create individualized student pages as well. So these are some of the questions that I have and some of them I still have and I'm exploring. And so some of the things that I wrestled with here, in terms of the blue, I was pretty comfortable with what I constructed. So player groupings, players as characters or avatars, I was happy with that. A balance of solo and group tasks, and then the steady growing of levels of difficulty, as well as taking on different roles. So they went from you know, being a novice to eventually teaching each other and sort of being a champion of the information that they were trying to figure out. The differentiated pacing of learning, we definitely had it, but it's something I need to play with more. Um, and student readiness to demonstrate knowledge and understanding. Those two, to me, go hand in hand. I'd also like to build in more differentiated demonstration. So give them different options, maybe about triangulating data, so conversations, observations, as well as product, but I think also a little bit of differentiation in terms of types of products. And then the last challenge is more uh, opportunities to show proficiency. So getting away from that. Okay, we finished level one. Now I've got to face the boss. I've got one opportunity. No, we need to have multiple opportunities for it. Hopefully you can't hear my son playing piano in the background. Okay. And so we've got two final quotes from James Paul Gee, and they are the key problem of our schools, and this to me goes back to the assignments and rubrics problem, is that we give them a lot of information, so the manuals, but it's not necessarily fun, the activity. So maybe we need to de-emphasize our well-constructed rubrics. I love constructed rubrics. I, I must have a problem. And focus more on making activities more fun. And then the last quote is, we could level the playing field. Okay, and I think this means for students and also the differences across boards and schools and that sort of thing. If we brought the activities, the problem solving, the living in the worlds of specific school subject areas with making kids want to do things with them. So allowing students to live in science, live in math, as opposed to just doing it or having so many problems to solve. In terms of Grace's question, what tech conferences would you recommend? Two in Ontario that are, are great places to start. I've mentioned before, one's ISTE's Bring It Together, which is in the, sorry, ECHO's Bring It Together, which is in the fall. And the second one is Connect, which is in the spring. So those are two options. Another option is Kitchener has this amazing um, Google session that they do. It's two days. It's eight sessions. It's at Eastwood Collegiate, uh, and it's in the spring. It's fantastic. It's all Google. Um, and then if you can get to ISTE, I think Mally was talking about it's in Denver, Colorado. Um, it's fantastic. So it's right at the end of the school year. 
Uh, it's in different places in the United States. I think the next year it's in Texas again. So those are some options, and I think there's on the rise K to 12 might have some, um, but definitely bring it together and connect would be two options where there would be some gamification. And before you go to the conference, you can always see what all the sessions are. So you don't have to go if there's not what you're looking for. Right. I do not know what term is used for gamification in French. If somebody could tell me that would be fantastic. <laughs> in terms of this last slide, this goes back to what we saw at the beginning with the Big Bang Theory. Um, this is something that you can get, uh, you can order it from the states. And uh, they have our website, breakout.edu. And you've got a nice little image from Sylvia Duckworth in terms of all the amazing reasons why you should try it with your class. And essentially what happens is one of these boxes will arrive uh, if you want it to. And you basically turn your classroom into an escape room. And so it's got all these puzzles and activities, and they have a number of different templates already created. So they might have zombie apocalypse or Shakespeare or, you know, some sort of virus that's about to become a pandemic. And you can design the game. They provide all the information, and then you tailor it using the box. And then probably if you played it a couple times, you could even really tailor it to your curriculum expectations. So it's just something that goes along with the whole gamification and game-based learning. But mine is on the way, and I'm looking forward to trying it in our dystopian novel unit, which is starting in a couple weeks. OK, we have badge and gamification system for French. I'm trying to see in the chat here has changed my teaching, can also use EduQuest for non-French subjects. OK, that's fantastic. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yep, the time thing is an issue, but you, could, you can try it in different ways. For example, you could try the game-based learning, where you drop a game into your classroom, as opposed to the full revamp of an entire course. Um, yeah, so you can definitely jump in depending on how much time you have to gamify something. This is just a little bit of contact information here, the slideshow with the links to all those resources, um, the Google form and even the Google Sheet that you guys completed at the beginning. And then lastly, this slideshow is made by Slides Carnival, the template. They all seem to be Shakespearean names. It's fantastic in terms of all the templates that they have. Do we have any final questions? It's 8.57. I know time is important for everybody. Any final questions or comments? No one brave enough to speak to it. Hmm. Okay. Thank you guys very much for coming out and attending tonight's session. Hope that wasn't too overwhelming in terms of the amount of information. Hopefully you'll try gamification in your classroom. Um, thanks, Derek. That was really amazing. I think Grace did have a question about what, just really quickly, what would you recommend as the first step, taking the first step? Yeah, so I would definitely either start with probably, for me, either a unit or an assignment where I wanted to build the cycle of learning um, for that specific unit or assignment around gamifying something. And so that would be my little sandbox in which to play. So that's what I would do as a starting point. How can I add a couple game elements? I would not do what I did or Mr. Paul Anderson did, which is redesign an entire unit. It was a lot of work initially, but it was also a lot of fun to construct it. But definitely start small. Like I said, some of my colleagues at another York Region School, they use RISC 
for a, you know a couple of lessons near the beginning. It really hooks the kids, and there's lots of teachable moments. So you might even find a game that you think connects to what you're doing, and maybe it's not curriculum. Maybe you're teaching learning skills, collaboration, those sorts of things, responsibility in that specific game. Awesome. That's really good advice. Okay. So thanks, Derek. That was just amazing. Um, and just a couple of things before we say goodnight. The first one is um, on this page is the um, link to the survey. Again, you can get it by clicking on the orange link or when you log out, you can, you'll can you also be directed right to it or the feedback um, survey link is in the chat box. And um, Derek brought this up as well. If you go to the OTS Connect website, there are um, there are usually webinars every evening, Monday to Thursday. And if you're interested in gamification, um, he mentioned that there are a couple coming up. And there are also a few on the screen as well. So um, you'll be set the recording in the next couple of days. And you'll have a list of all the resources. Derek provided a ton of information. So um, what wasn't put in the chat box, because it was too much, will be in the um, in the resource link. So thanks everyone for coming out and have a great evening.